Hi, I'm Katie, and you're listening to Twin Mamas Yoga Mat Podcast. Hello there, Ashley. How are you? Hello, I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on and speaking with us today. So, thanks for having I'm me. So delighted to welcome Ashley Robson, who is a very experienced midwife working with over 13 years with families in the Murray area. And Ashley and I recently met three Murray businesswomen. I'm really glad that we did. And at a recent women's wellness event, I heard Ashley talking all about our new business. And I thought, oh, I would just love to get Ashley on to, to chat and ask some of my pregnancy clients and on Facebook and Instagram if there's any questions that you'd like to put across there. So thank you, Ashley. Totally excited about this. So you've recently started your own business. Murray Maternity Therapy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, um, as you said, I'm a midwife. I work at Dr. Gray's. Um, I have, over the last couple of years, been training in complementary therapies, specifically for pregnancy um, and the preconception postnatal times, and decided that I wanted to set up my own business offering these services to women so they can come to me and I can treat them for all sorts of different pregnancy complaints using a range of different therapies. That's amazing. I've actually caught you on a really good day as well. I saw about your award that you won last night. I'm so chuffed for you. Can you tell us a little about that as well? I've got it here actually. So yes, um, I was um, up at Inverness at the University of Highlands and Islands last night for their yearly new and emerging business awards. And this is where they have any business it doesn't necessarily need to be trading yet, it can just be an idea um, or NMD within the first year of trading and you get nominated and shortlisted to be a finalist if you are lucky enough, which I was. And then there's different awards for different areas. Um, so things like engineering, cultural, uh, environmental things. And I won the Best New Business for Social Impact Award. So I was absolutely delighted with that. Really, really pleased. Well Gave done. Me a chance. Thank you very much. Amazing. Gave me a chance to get the, the, the inspiration and the kind of motivation behind the, the business out there and um, let people know a bit about what I'm hoping to achieve with this. Definitely. And um, you had to give a speech. You had to deliver something. So yes, yeah, so I had to, originally I had to um, just post uh, on a via email just a bit, a kind of brief synopsis of the business um, and what was behind it. Then they shortlisted 15 of us to be finalists and I had to go up yesterday and present to a panel of five judges just a, a short 15 minute presentation about the business, like to see what sort of inspired it what I've done to set it up and what I'm aiming to achieve um, and just kind of handed out a few leaflets and give them an idea about what, what it's about. Oh, that's amazing. I'm so happy for you. Well deserved. So one of the questions that we've had come through is what inspired you to become a midwife and how did you get started in this field? So I came into midwifery a little bit later. I didn't go into it straight from school. I actually had gone and done a psychology degree prior to that when on leaving school. I then had my oldest child, who's now 17, and going off to uni himself this summer. I had him in Aberdeen because I was living there at the time. <sighs> Without wanting to go into too many details, it wasn't exactly the best experience uh, labour-wise. My pregnancy was fine, but I had a horrific time in labour. And although I never, ever had any issues with the care I received, everybody was fantastic. It did sort of make my perception of midwifery a bit skewed I think um, and then when it came to having number two I was actually back up here living by then and had her at Dr Gray's and it was like a completely different ball game I mean the labour and pregnancy itself was different as they all are but I just I couldn't get over how supportive and friendly the midwives were and it was like being it was with friends, with family during my labour. I just, we laughed, the midwives that cared for me, we just laughed the whole way through my labour, had an absolutely fantastic time. And afterwards, the care that I received, it was just amazing. And I remember thinking to myself, God, this is what midwifery is about. This is what it should be. Um, and although I was classed as high risk, I, mainly midwives, I had a consultant who was lovely, but you know, I, was, I, I wasn't made to feel any different to anybody else in there. I was 
I was just another woman in having her baby. So um, I then sort of started looking into midwifery. Didn't think I would get in because I had no medical background at all. I've never been in, had any desire to do anything along nursing or any kind of lines. That's not for me. But when I looked at the course, I realised that actually midwifery is not about the care necessarily. It's about that social impact and the the whole holistic sense of what you do as a midwife and um, supporting these families. It's not just about the women. But I applied, applied for Robert Gordon in Aberdeen. Didn't think I would get him. Um, I think there was about 200 applicants that year for 24 spaces. So it was, wow, it was uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough course to get into. Um, went for an interview and yeah, got accepted for the course. So it was all a bit of a whirlwind. It all happened really quickly. Um, did my training between uh, Aberdeen and Dr. Gray's. I was lucky enough to get most of my placements at Dr. Gray's. So um, you know, I've kind of been a member of the team. They treated me like a member of the team right from the start. And yeah, following um, qualifying, I got a job there and been there ever since. So don't want to leave. Oh, it's like I love it. Every time that I've spoken with you, I can tell how passionate you are about mm. your job. So obviously that must come through. And okay. it's, it's been great that you, you managed to get through all that. So how do you work with expectant mothers during pregnancy and what kind of support do you provide? So in my NHS role, I am hospital based and work on the ward. Um, I'm sure most of your uh, viewers will have either been there themselves or are going there at the minute for pregnancy reasons. But we cover everything on the ward from preconception, women that have maybe had losses or that have had a previous loss and are looking to get pregnant now, right through the pregnancy, throughout labour and then postnatally as well. Um, as a ward midwife at Dr. Gray's, like I say, it's, it's so dynamic. Some days you'll be looking after somebody that's maybe had a, a bereavement, had a loss. The next day you could be looking after somebody in the labour ward. The following day it could be a postnatal breastfeeding mum. So it's very, very varied what we do. And um, we're skilled in all the areas and we, we use a lot of our skills throughout the day in different, different um, manners. And then obviously with my new business, I'm taking that, I'm going to continue with my NHS role as well, but I'm taking that out of um, the NHS setting and into my clinic setting, which is at home, which is actually what I'm in now. And I'm going to be combining my midwifery skills, my midwifery knowledge with my complementary therapies to offer support in any way that women need. So it can be, that could be for a physical reason, back pain, sciatica, nausea, vomiting, anything along that lines to get women into labour, but also as because I'm a midwife, I'll be able to offer them that support that they need as well, that information, that chatting about birth plans, where they're going to go, hopefully help relieve some anxiety if they have to travel to Aberdeen for deliveries and things like that. And um, so it's just combining the two really. That's amazing. And definitely like all the things you were mentioning there, a lot of my pregnancy clients that come along to the yoga classes, they're always uh, mentioning these things. So it's it's amazing to have someone as well to refer on and, and obviously with your experience there. I've seen the photos at your, your clinic. It looks, it looks lovely and really relaxing as well. So it's great because sure it, it's at home as well. So I'm just through the doors and I'm here. Perfect. Oh, that's great. So what are some of the most common misconceptions about midwifery and how do you address them? So... The biggest one has to be that all we do is play with babies all day long. <laughs> that we deliver babies and we play with babies. That is absolutely not the case. As I said earlier, actually, the delivery, the labour and delivery bits, probably one of the smallest parts in terms mm -hmm. of the care that we provide. Obviously, for parents, it's the biggest part. But for us, you know, that journey starts right at the very start with these women. Um, and we're there to support them the whole way through not just in terms of having their baby, but we're looking at them as a whole, as a, a mum, as a family unit, and everything about this journey into parenthood, which, I mean, you've done it. It's a massive thing. It's a huge, huge thing yeah, for parents. Absolutely. We're here for, for all that. I mean, we're, we're a mixture of everything. We're like social workers. We're like midwives. You know, we, we do everything really for these women. And mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people don't understand the whole gravity of that that it's not just that one day that they're having their baby it's a huge it's a huge thing apart from that the other thing I think is that um midwives we're not we're not nurses 
um, we used to be, you used to have to do your nursing training before you did your midwifery. And you can still convert from a nurse to a midwife now, but anyone coming into midwifery now is a completely separate entity. You do a completely separate degree. And we are different in the sense that we are what's classed as autonomous practitioners. So we're allowed to do things on our own. We can prescribe certain things. We can do things that um, doctors do, obviously putting cannulas in, put, you know, suturing women, things like that. So we've got a lot, a bigger scope compared to maybe a nurse working in a hospital. So as, as good as that is, it's also quite scary at times because we, we're responsible for our care. You know, what we provide, we're ultimately the ones responsible for it. So, so it's a lot of pressure, but yeah, it's great. Love it. No, absolutely. And um, being through it myself as well, it's, it's such a important time mm -hmm. and uh, a sensitive time. So having somebody like, well, like yourself, um, they are along with you in the journey. It's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. That's something that I found with well, my pregnancy when I was down um, living with Rhodium. I, I had different appointments kind of scattered all over the place because I was under a twin consultant, mm -hmm. which was at St John's Hospital, but I was also living in Armadale in Bathgate. So my midwife appointments were there, but then I also had to go to a different place for like my weekly scans for twins. And I did find like I had a lack of that sort of consistency and being like the same person. And so what you're saying, I think it's, it's really important to your patient. Okay, so how do you help women prepare for labor and delivery? And what are some techniques that you use to manage pain and discomfort? So I think it's important. It's, it's hard to get that fine balance. You want to start preparing women sort of mentally quite early on in the pregnancy. Um, you know, we we'll, the community midwives especially are fantastic. They'll start bringing in conversations around delivery and pain relief and things early in the pregnancy. Um, women are uh, um, advised to put together a bit of a birth plan on their notes. It um, doesn't have to be anything specific, but just little bits and pieces so that we have an idea of what they may be are thinking they would like. Now, obviously, everyone that's had a baby will know that nine times out of 10, it doesn't go how you were expecting it. Could be better, could be worse. But having just a few kind of simple things noted down about what you might want is a good idea, particularly for a partner as well. So that if, you know, in the throes of labour, the woman herself's just not really getting what she wants and or doesn't, you know, know what she wants to do, the partner, although it doesn't have I see he can't override what she's saying that he can be there to sort of say look this is what she'd say it's during the pregnancy and um, this is what she would prefer to avoid etc etc um, in terms of labor themselves when the ladies come in we're very much guided by what they want to do and um, obviously at Dr Grace we are slightly more limited in what we offer pain relief wise we have the, the gas in the end knobs um, and we have morphine we also have um, non-medicalized things so things like tens machines uh, heat pads and we have our birthing pool as well um, which women can opt to go into and it's just it's very much about building up that relationship with your woman so that you can be able to guide her and how you feel it's never about saying right I think you need to have xyz now or no you don't need this it's about being able to read your woman and say look this is maybe the time to have think about this or no, look, you're almost there. You don't need it. Let's just keep going. And a lot of women will say to us afterwards, like, God, oh, you know, I really appreciated that you made me, well, not made me, but you know, you advised me to do this at this point because it worked really well. Or, and it, it, it comes with experience, but it is, it does help if you kind of had that chat with women before that. And um, obviously, me myself, I also offer aromatherapy and massage in the ward for labor. If I'm on that shift and there's somebody in labor, I can offer aromatherapy and massage for them as well. Um, and hopefully that's something that will get built up in the ward so more midwives are changing it as well and can offer it. And the women that I've cared for that I've offered that to absolutely love it. That's amazing, Ashley. And even when you're saying there just now about like how you you speak to the women and stuff, that's something that stayed with me like through my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of the sort of language that was used, um, I think subconsciously put out a lot of negativity in my mind. And um, just I shared this with you before, just like with the twin pregnancy and stuff, being told like 
you're having twins, it, it will be very painful. You're, you're having two babies, it's going to be twice the pain of one and things like that. And in my mind, I've I had that in my mind all the way through. And it's only now that I'm obviously like delivering my classes when the ladies are sharing in the circle at the start. They're talking about their sort of, um, they can share openly anything they want to chat about, but if they're discussing any of their worries and things and, and these kind of things come up, it, it's um, important that we, we try and make a, a, obviously a positive Absolutely. environment for them because it's then going to help everything overall, the whole Absolutely. experience. I mean, I think sort of traditionally years ago, you never really talked about it to women because you didn't. There was that perception that if you brought it up antenatally, you would scare them into, you know, thinking, "Oh my God, this is horrific. I can't do it." But mm -hmm. like I say, there needs to be a balance because there's nothing worse than somebody coming in in labour who has absolutely no idea what's going on and what to expect. At least if somebody's got a bit of an idea of what may happen, and um, then the, you know, hopefully they'll be a little bit calmer. And, Calmness definitely helps. If nothing else, calmness definitely helps. So, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. So, next question. How do you help women navigate the postpartum period and what kind of support do you provide during this time? So, again, when we've had ladies that deliver at Dr. Gray's, we, it's the same midwife that obviously then cares for them for the remainder of that shift and potentially the following day if they're on again. Um, we, the postnatal part at Dr. Grace is the same area, it's the same, it's all one ward, so we bring them up to from the ward up and then it's really, after that, it's really dependent on the women. I mean, some women come in, it's maybe baby number three, four, however many they've had and they know what they're doing and really we're just then there to kind of care for mum more than baby to be honest and that kind of hours after delivery, you know, making sure she's comfortable pain relief wise and um, make sure she's eating, drinking. Then obviously there's mums that maybe need a bit more support, first time mums, mums who maybe had a very difficult experience the first time, um, mums that have maybe had a bit of a difficult experience during this pregnancy. So we're there for support with breastfeeding, um, we're there for support with just normal baby care for mums that have never seen a baby before. Um, but a lot of it also is just emotional care. So, you know, you'll get women that all want, and there's something to be said about that middle of the night when the, everything's quiet and it's just you and the woman in the room and they offload to us so much. And it's, it's a really good time to be able to discuss things with women that they've um, experienced or they're worried about. Women generally are in with us a lot shorter now than they ever were before. Um, it's un unusual for them to be in with us longer than maybe one or two nights. Um, so then when they go home, the community midwives take over and they do a fantastic job. They go out, see the ladies at home. Again, very tailored to the individual. Some ladies may only see a couple of times if they are happy with everything. Other ladies might get support every single day. Um, but it's very much a individual-based care programme as well that we do. That's great, but So what are some of the most rewarding aspects of being a midwife and what are some of the challenges that you face in your work? Uh, I mean, the reward, and uh, let's say, as much as I say that the delivery bit's a small part of it, emotionally, it is a huge part for us. I mean, we're there at a moment where, you know, we're so privileged to be there to see these families becoming you know, a new unit, whether it's a first baby or a baby number five, you know, every baby's special. And to just to see that emotion and relief in the parents' faces is, is amazing. And I still get really emotional at every delivery I'm at. Um, and I think for us as well, it's there's a huge sense of relief when that baby comes out and everything's fine and you think, right, everyone can just calm down now. Um, and yeah, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. But also just that care in the pregnancy to let's like, say to know you've been there and supported a woman the whole way through whether you've seen her once whether you've seen her twice or hundreds of times you know as that we're a, we're a team and to know that everybody's worked together to to help these families become a family it's 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 brilliant and I've got so many friends now from people that I've cared for whether just once in the pregnancy or whether I've delivered their babies and it's just, then they'll come to me like you know years later sometimes I'll, I'll bump into them and they're like oh you know it's wonderful to see you and I always remember you said this and you did that and it was really you know it really made a lot it really helped me out and 
it's just yeah it's amazing oh it's so heartwarming Mm -hmm. it is it's it really is the best job in the world like I can't argue with that obviously at the minute it is quite challenging I mean it's always been a a challenging job in the terms of you know as much as we've got wonderful outcomes we also have very scary and difficult times and you know you're dealing with parents that have had losses you're dealing with emergency situations which you know we've got not just one life in our hands but we've got two we've got mama and baby and it's a lot of pressure but certainly recently with the the downgrade to Dr Grace yeah because obviously we're having to travel with women to Aberdeen in situations that you, you know potentially could be having a baby at the side of the road we're very aware of that literally there's just us there we might have well, obviously we've got a paramedic with us as well but you know often they've never even seen a delivery so you're kind of sitting there thinking god this is this is all in me here and it's it's a scary and plus you know we we want to be able to offer our women the services that we've always done it's the women loved Dr Grace as a unit when it was a consultant unit it was so highly thought of and for us not to be able to offer that anymore it's it's really hard and you know it's been it's taken a real toll on a lot of us in the system and uh, yeah hopefully things will be and a lot of anxiety um within patients mm-hmm. and stuff as well a lot of the the girls that I've had come into the things the classes and stuff they mention about it and mm-hmm. interested to see what the outcome will it's be obviously mm-hmm. and when you were saying there about the rewarding parts of the job I can't even imagine what it'd be like for you because even for me seeing the girls like weekly some of them coming along since they were 12 weeks and then the stay in the group chat and stuff that we've got in the class and um, nine times out of ten they'll share a photo once they're, they've got their happy news and uh, even if it's in the middle of the night if I get the photo I'm like oh my god and I, I feel so excited because I actually feel like really connected it's as amazing. well so I can't even imagine what you'd be like if you're there at the bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think as well the good thing is that the majority of us that work in the team we've had our children at least one or two of them we've all had at least one child there and you know so we we've now seen colleagues in that position and we've been that person in that position and like I was lucky enough that um, it was my closest friend at work who was there when my youngest was born and then we laugh about the things I was doing and saying now but just knowing that she was there was just amazing and then he ended up going to the special care nursery and it was another really close friend of mine that cared for him in there and we're like a family and it, yeah it's just it's amazing oh that's really special especially like having a team around you that's also friends as well so how do you stay up to date with the latest research and best practices in midwifery and how do you incorporate this knowledge into your practice I know that you've already covered some of this with your your business as well yeah yeah I mean I think as midwives we're naturally always looking for new information there's always it's just an inbuilt thing in us anyway but um nurses and midwives we have to do something called revalidation so every three years we this is the nursing midwifery council that run this we have to provide um I suppose evidence that we have been keeping up to date and you have to do so many hours of um continuous professional development it's called so you have to do participatory stuff you have to do online stuff a lot of it's mandatory stuff that we would be doing anyway but also all your things like your additional courses that you do um training things you've read online looking at journals that all counts so because we have to do that I think it then kind of prompts people to do more and to be honest there's always something new something exciting to learn um I've done a lot of training obviously Covid kind of put a bit of a uh, stop to a lot of it but in the last year or two I've done a load of new training and things that I wanted to do and there's always a new skill to learn something exciting I mean recently I was involved in um, workshops developing trauma care pathways that are going to be coming into effect in grampian so working with families that have dealt with all sorts of trauma not just birth trauma but you know migrants people with financial difficulties partners that have maybe had ptsd from being in the forces then you know going through the pregnancy journey and that was amazing like learning all of that um, was fantastic so yeah it's something that we just i think is built into us now but we do have to do it anyway so that's amazing, actually. It's so interesting as well, all the different backgrounds and everything that you have worked with. 
what advice would you give to women who are considering working with a midwife for their pregnancy and childbirth? So obviously in the UK, um, everybody gets allocated to a midwife. Um, that's a sort of standard care in the UK compared to other countries. What may differ for some women is that they may see the consultant mode as well. I mean, we try very hard to ensure that even a woman that's high risk is helped to feel that she's still normal and that there's nothing different for her. So as much as she may be seeing the consultant every week or two weeks, whatever they need, they'll still see the community midwives as well and they'll still be involved in that way. Um, so we encourage people to try and build up that communication with the midwives because they are the community midwives are the first port of call for a lot of them for like questions, you know, little bits and pieces that they might think, well, you know, I don't really need to ask the consultant this, but I want to, I need to know, oh, like, and I will always say to them, you know, even though you're being seen at the ward or you're being seen by the consultant, just get in touch with your community midwife as well. They're there for anything. And the community midwives are absolutely fantastic. They build up a really good bond with their, their ladies, their caseloads. And say so they'll often have the message in them at random times with really random questions, but that's what they're there for. So, yeah, we would say, you know, no matter what, journey you're on in terms of your care package your midwife is always going to be the most important person in that package and make the most of it make the most of the midwives mm -hmm. that's amazing and i'm sure all your patients do really appreciate it as well and that'll just be so important to them on their journey that they that they can get in touch and absolutely so what do you see as the future of, of midwifery and how do you think this field will continue to evolve in the coming years? Oh, I mean, obviously the biggest thing at the minute for us is getting the unit back up to what it once was. Um, that's the goal for all of us at the minute. And we obviously are working really closely with the Scottish government and things to be able to implement that. But I think there's a lot to be said now for individual care as well like uh, the, prior to the downgrades we were very much just this is the pathway that you're on this is the pathway that you're on and nobody really deviated and you had your set your very very set appointments and things like yourself you had one appointment for this one appointment for that one for something else I think we need to be more adaptable to what we can offer and what we can work with women to provide so that women are getting a really really individualized package of care um, and whether that's things like whether it's physical support that they need, I mean, not everybody will need that, but emotional care, you know, just general pregnancy care, it needs to be a lot more adaptive, I think. And there is a lot of plans um, in the this sort of work and plans that we've got for building back up. There is a lot of plans to have more specialised things going on um, in Dr. Grace so that women feel that they're not having to travel to Aberdeen for the more specialised things that they're getting. Yeah. A specific mm -hmm. package for what they want and obviously for me like I'm really hoping you know wanting to push integrating the uh, complementary therapies into care as well and um, getting that more of a, a standard because in things like cancer care you know acupuncture and things is provided by the NHS as standard and midwifery we don't have that and it's something mm -hmm. that can make a huge difference these little extra pieces that women can access um, so hopefully in the next couple of years we'll be able to offer more what are some of the the um, procedures that you can offer through Murray Maternity Therapies? So at Dr. Grease, all I'm allowed to do there is um, aromatherapy and massage. And I offer um, that to, I can offer that for any of the pregnancy complaints that women are having. And um, let's say they just get I refer to me through a colleague on the ward if they've seen somebody and you know the woman's talked about back pain or something then they can get them in touch with me and I can organise an appointment. The other thing I do at the hospital is a post dates pregnancy um, situation where myself and um, one of the community midwives, Julie, who also did the aromatherapy training with me um, and Karen Orr as well, she's just back from maternity leave. The three of us offer women that are past their due date that are hoping to go into labour naturally, we offer appointments where they can come, they can, we can practice acupressure on certain points on the body and aromatherapy that will hopefully help contractions to begin on their own. Um, that is quite limited because it's got to be women that are really low risk and obviously time-wise and things, it's slightly limited at the minute, but we're hoping that can build and we can offer more of that. Um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to offer anything else at Dr. Gray's, as I say, just because of um, 
like health and safety and insurance purposes and things. But what I offer at home is acupuncture for any kind of pregnancy complaint. I offer um, moxibustion, which is a Chinese treatment that turns breech babies. Um, the aromatherapy and massage, they can be done together or separately, whatever women want. Um, I also am in the process of doing the clinical hypnosis training. So I'll be able to offer hypnosis for things like phobias, so fear of needles, fear of labour, stress and anxiety about the Aberdeen situation, um, help to stop smoking, um, help to deal with like previous birth trauma and things like that. So a lot I, there's a lot I can offer. Um, and sometimes it's a tailored package of different things. But I advise the women to get in touch with me rather than looking at the therapies and saying, right, I want that. I advise them to get in touch with me and discuss what their issues are because there may be something different that works better for them. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Them. And then obviously, like that sort of consultation, and you can advise yeah. that all of those things. It's um, you're. I'm sure that your your new business is just going to absolutely explode because everything that you're saying is just something that is so needed and it's just mm-hmm. unreal. So <laughs> I'm so excited for you and to see how how it will grow in the upcoming months and years. A question from a viewer, what can you suggest to help with nausea and vomiting? Okay, so this is obviously a huge one. Um, Lots of women will suffer nausea and vomiting to a certain degree. Most women are lucky that it's mild and, you know, maybe just the nausea on occasion, um, with the occasional vomiting. Some women have it horrifically bad and to the point where it's really, really impacts on their mental health um, and in the worst cases we do often get women who feel they can't go on with the pregnancies because they're so badly affected by the nausea and vomiting. Now obviously if it's women at that stage it does need to be more of a medicalised approach and we advise them to contact the ward or their community midwife to discuss that um, and possibly you know having to come in for treatments and things but as a general sort of sense we would always suggest to women first that they speak to your GP early because we can get medications to help you oral medications and the the earlier and the more sort of frequently you're taking these the better they're going to work and a lot of women will take them initially sort of sporadically or take them for a few weeks and then feel better and then they'll stop taking them and then it starts all over again so it's about getting that good practice in early and keeping it going but from things you can do for yourself at home um, eating little and often is great small meals We often say it doesn't really matter what you're eating as long as you're liking something. You know, if if somebody, all they want to eat is ice lollies, fine. At the end of the day, the baby will take what it needs from you and you'll cope. It's just getting yourself through that um, with whatever means you need to. Drinking is a big thing, so making sure you're keeping your fluid levels up. And like I say, things like ice poles and ice lollies are great for that if you can't physically tolerate the fluids. Um, small snacks having something at the side of the bed that you can nibble on when you you get up in the morning now something that a lot of people will come to us asking about is ginger and i have to say ginger biscuits are not the way to do it everybody automatically runs and buys ginger biscuits you'd have to eat about 100 to get the right amount of ginger into you which would be lovely you know if you like a ginger biscuit that's (laughs) fine but and it's good from that point of view that it's a nice kind of dry thing you could nibble on so it's not going to do you any harm but from a um, medical point of view, there's not enough ginger and ginger biscuits to make any difference to you whatsoever. You're better with things like ginger tea. So um, brewing ginger tea and we've got leaflets and things that we can give women about how to do that. Um, and also not going the opposite way and taking too much, because if you're taking in too much ginger, it can actually have a negative effect. But things like peppermint oil. So having a, a vial of peppermint essential oil, just smelling that, that's really good as well citrusy flavours works anything that's quite a clean flavour tends to work quite well with women and um, avoiding harsh perfumes and things is good as well and then if all else fails come along and see me and I'll do some treatments for you I mean things like acupuncture is fantastic for nausea and vomit and it's so so good um, and actually one of the points we use is that point here that the travel bands that women will use but 90% of women are using them on the wrong place so they're not going to work. Do you come along to me and I can do some acupuncture on that points for you and then show you how to use the bands effectively to continue with that. That's amazing. And all the information for those treatments will be on your website as well. Yes, yeah, everything's on there. Yeah, and like I say, women can always get in touch with me. I'm on all the social medias, so women yeah. can get in touch with me and um, to ask if they or I mean I'm happy to just give advice over emails and things as well. You don't have to come and see me, I'm more than happy to give advice. 
that's fab. Will Raspberry Leaf Tea help me get into labour? So this is another controversial one. It's one thing that everyone seems to have heard of towards the end of their pregnancy. So always friends will talk about it. You know, you might have midwives who don't really understand how it works. They'll talk about it. But actually, a lot of women are using it in their own way. A lot of midwives are promoting it in their own way. So with raspberry leaf tea, it's not going to put you into labour. What it's going to do is it's going to help to tone your uterus to make it more effective. So when those contractions do start, they'll work better. Um, it's like I say, it's not going to cause the contractions. It's just going to help your body to use them more effectively. A bit like, like say, with the yoga, like obviously training your muscles. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, the goal. It's not about creating the contractions. It's about giving them the, what they need to make them more effective. The other thing that we find is that women, will, will, they'll start using the raspberry leaf tea far too late. So they'll start using it at their due date thinking, oh, I need to get into labour now. It's not going to work mm -hmm. if you've only started it the week before you go into labour. We recommend that you can start it from 32 weeks. It does need to be smaller volumes and then you build it up and then sort of from 36 weeks, you're obviously going to be on the full kind of dose. And by that point, it should have had a good effect on your muscles and um, help things to, to come more effective when the time actually comes. But again, anybody that's not sure can get in touch with me and I can give them some advice about that. Amazing. And the final question, what will happen if I need to be increased? <laughs> Yeah, so this is a big one at the minute because obviously women having to go to Aberdeen for this, the women are married. So it depends a lot on the reason why you're being induced. Um, for obviously a lot of women, it's purely that they've passed their, their due date and this baby just does not want to come out and they're going to need a bit of a hand to get things going. For other women, it could be because there's a concern with either mum or baby, whether that's down to baby size, whether that's an issue with mum such as preeclampsia. Um, whether it's a concern that if they go too far over, it may cause more problems if they've maybe had a previous traumatic delivery in the past and they want to avoid that again. So whatever way it happens, obviously there'll be different points in the pregnancy. So the first thing really for us is that we're going to assess a woman to work out how favourable she's going to be to be induced and what method we're going to need to do with it. So what generally happens is that Aberdeen will allocate a date for a woman and she will be given that date and then it's almost a bit like she goes on call that day. So Aberdeen in the morning will look at their induction lists and work out who needs to be brought in ASAP, who can be brought in later that day and who could wait till the next day. Obviously a lot of that depends on their workload on that day as well. When a woman is then sort of next on the list, Everybody will phone ourselves at Dr. Gray's and ask us to bring the lady in to ask to assess her. Um, and we do that by a vaginal examination to see what our cervix is doing, basically. Now, we use something called the Cook Balloons. Now, you may not have heard of that, but um, it's kind of before you had your boys, it would have been. But essentially, it's a, it's a method of softening the cervix, which doesn't involve any drugs, so women can then go home with it in, rather than previous times where when you came in for induction, you were in for days and days and days in the hospital doing nothing. So this, it's like, it's almost like a catheter, like a urinary catheter, it goes into the cervix, fills with water, and then the two balloons just sit on the cervix and put a bit of pressure on it to hopefully soften things up. Like I say, the women then go home with that in after 24 hours, it's taken out, and then they go to Aberdeen then to have their waters broken. If somebody comes into us and their cervix is already soft and open enough that we could break their waters, they then just go home again and wait for Aberdeen to call them to go straight to the labour ward and they get their waters broken. And then it's just a case of how well their labour progresses after that. So one of the biggest services that I offer, um, as I said before, myself and two of my colleagues at the hospital offer a post-dates clinic. So we, from seven days past their due date, women can come and see us and we will perform acupressure and aromatherapy massage on specific points on the body that can help promote contractions to start and to soften service and things like helping the baby to move down if they're still a little bit high um, that they can access through their community midwives and um, we can organize appointment to come in and do that with them there me, myself, from the business, I can offer this earlier. Um, I can do from 37 weeks of pregnancy what's called birth preparation. So it's not as intense as the post-date stuff, but it's a similar thing in that I'll be um, 
using this, the same points to provide either pressure with the active pressure tools or to use acupuncture um, just to kind of help the body get ready for labour and things. I can do uh, massages and things as well to help promote um, natural labour. Once they hit their due date, I can see them with term on their, their date of delivery um, and right through till whenever they go into labour or whether they go to be induced. And uh, it can be used with um, the medical induction. So I can see them, even if they're going to be going in, in for induction, say on a Friday, I can see them right up till the Thursday. Um, because actually, even if it doesn't put them into labour, all that process is we're doing can help to soften the cervix and make it an easier labour. So it's not just about that whole getting you going, it might actually help to make things easier. And with, there's loads of research to say that women that have had birth preparation, uh, things like lower uh, need for analgesia, lower um, complications, lower cesarean section rates, there's a huge amount of research into it. So even if I can't get you into labour, I hope we'll be able to help get you an easier ride once it actually starts. So yeah, there's lots that we can do to help and hopefully the, the world will get out and women will be able to come in and see men more women will be able to have their babies at Dr. Bay's, hopefully. Oh, Ashley, that's absolutely amazing. Obviously, you can just tell like how passionate you are about your, your job and also just like so knowledgeable and experienced. And it's been really interesting, like listening to everything you're saying. And I, I actually feel like I could um, listen to you for ages about all these things. So I'm sure that the viewers will have got the answer to the questions that they were wanting to know. Yeah. And how else can we get in touch with you? What can you remind us of your website? So the so website cool. is um, www.itsmurraymaternitytherapies.co.uk. So really easy. I have got Facebook, which is also just under Murray Maternity Therapies, and I have got Instagram. Um, and there's contact buttons on both of those that they can pop in a form. Um, I also on the all the social media is my um, email address and my phone number, so women are welcome to get in touch with me. Sometimes, like I say, it's just for a chat, really, just to see if I can suggest anything at home, um, or they can get in touch with me to if they know they want a specific treatment, they can book it um, themselves online, or they can get in touch with me to just discuss what I can offer, what would be the most viable thing for them. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate your time for coming on and you take care. I just wanted to say one other thing as well. Um, just a new service that I've just started offering as well is uh, like a preconception and fertility service. Um, so anyone oh, who has maybe had issues in the past with um, infertility or cycle regularly, so maybe women with polycystic ovaries, women who have irregular cycles, um, I can work with them over the space of a month or two to help using uh, acupuncture and uh, acupressure to help regulate their cycles to get them back into a regular cycle. I'll also do things like food diaries and discussing lifestyle and things to help them pick out things that may be an inf impact in their ability to, to get pregnant and get the ball rolling for them, so to speak. So I'm really excited about that. that. That's, That's so exciting. Um, I've actually just invested in an add-on to my qualification, Yoga for Fertility. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to start it um, at the end of June. So I'm going to be studying that over the summer. And I'm really excited about it. So when you're saying that there, I was like, oh, that's exciting. Maybe we there we go, another oh, collaboration. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Yeah, that's I'm so really excited for the part. That's great. Was there anything else? No, I don't think so. It's yeah. been really nice to be able to tell you all about that. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. You take care. No bothers. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye.